Greetings to my friends in Amman. I'm really sorry not to be able to join you this year for the 16th annual PRC. I'm unfortunately uh, not uh, housebound by COVID or other problems like that, but uh, much, much work uh, administratively and at Vanderbilt uh, University, and I would give anything to be there. I look forward very much to joining you next year. Last year, we talked, or last year in 2020, we talked about Kleinfelter syndrome, a condition that I thought pediatricians don't understand well enough, and we don't do a good service to these children because many of them are never diagnosed in their lifetime. And I wanted to spend the time this year to, to talk about a companion syndrome, if, if you wanna call it that, Turner syndrome. Maybe more familiar to many of us, uh, but one that also I think we don't do a good enough job as pediatricians in identifying early, identifying resources, uh, deficits, and caring for these kids. And so I want to uh, uh, contrast the two and um, also uh, tell you more about Turner syndrome. Now, I'm going to do a brief run through of what we talked about a couple of years ago. I, I, many of you probably weren't there, but Kleinfelter syndrome affects males. It's about one in 500 to one in 1,000 men have this condition. It's not rare. You know people with this, even if you don't know that they have it. The genotype of these men is XXY. Now, there are variations of this. There's mosaic forms, but generally they have a male phenotype. If you look at this, this picture is from uh, Kleinfelter's original paper on this, uh, and they are unequivocally male in their gender identity. It's not a gender dysphoria group. They're very tall men. They have very long legs and abnormal body proportions. They have one of the hallmarks is primary gonadal failure. They get hyalinization of the testes. They're infertile. The production of testosterone is low. They often have disorders of puberty. They're prone to autoimmune diseases. Uh, and there's a very high incidence of gynecomastia that persists lifelong. Uh, the chest on this man is not muscles, that's breast tissue. And they're also prone to breast cancers, breast and other cancers, uh, in particular germinomas. Now, the other thing about Kleinfelters, there are these medical issues that we learn in medical school. What really, really makes these men have difficulties in life is a high incidence of behavioral and psychosocial dysfunction. Now, I, I, the big picture in my mind is that only about 25 to 50% of these men are ever diagnosed in their lifetime, meaning at least 50% or more are never diagnosed and never have the benefit of appropriate monitoring and therapy. The average age of diagnosis is 30 years old, which means we missed it as pediatricians. If that's the average age of diagnosis, the majority of these diagnoses are made in adulthood. I mean, th this condition ought to be easily detected in childhood, but you have to look. And to be very specific, when you examine children and, or adolescents at least once in their life, you need to examine the testicles. The Kleinfelter's testis is very small, very rubbery, very firm, and uh, should, should alert you right away that this, this could be a Kleinfelter boy and needs a karyotype. Now, Turner's, the subject of today, uh, it's, it's about one in 2,000 to one in 5,000 live-born women. Now, there's a very high fetal loss of this, so a huge number of fetuses are uh, XO have the karyotype of Turner syndrome and are don't make it to uh, to term. the The standard karyotype is an absence of one X chromosome, so they're instead of forty six XX, they're forty six X. Now there are variations on this. We'll discuss in just a moment. And mosaicism, which makes the clinical phenotype more uh, tricky. These women, these are women. They are unfalteringly female, feminine in their gender identity. Um, they're always very short, contrast them to the Kleinfelter's men who are, tend to be quite tall, and they have skeletal nail dysmorphisms. You can see some features here that I'll talk a little bit more about in terms of her arms. They're, they're quite short. The average height of an adult Turner woman uh, untreated is 145 centimeters. They have hearing disorders. They have endocrine disorders too. Their gonads are not normal. In the absence of the second X, they develop what are called streak ovaries. They're infertile. They don't go through puberty. They are also prone to autoimmune diseases and osteoporosis, secondary to the lack of estrogenization at, um, uh, at puberty, which they don't go through. Oops. And um, they 
have issues with lymphedema as infants and adults, uh, significant cardiac defects, aortic stenosis in particular, renal anomalies. They also have neurocognitive uh, dysfunctions. The Kleinfelter's men are more likely to get in trouble with the law. They have short fuses. They, it's, it's a wonderful group of people. I really enjoy these patients, but they, they, their issues are, are very different. Turner's women are, if anything, kind of more placid. Um, their, their intelligence is normal. And the big picture here is that we probably do a better job of identifying Turner women at some point in their life. But in a study in Denmark that I'll show you in just a moment, the average age was about 14 years, meaning far too late to start growth hormone treatment to get their stature in, more in line with the, the, uh, the general population, also to initiate puberty hormones at the appropriate time, and also to identify the learning deficits that we know that these women have early enough to make an impact on their school performance, on their, on their progress through, um, through school. So why we fail these women, before I start telling you how, just how you can find them, let's look here. This is again from um, Denmark, uh, 979 women and 95,000 controls in Denmark over a, a 30 year period. This is when they're diagnosed. Now you see there's a big spike here in the uh, at zero. Those are, those are fetuses that are spontaneously aborted that are XO. The, the live-born Turner women uh, typically are diagnosed at uh, just around the time of adolescence, 50% of them though. That means the other 50% aren't diagnosed till out here. And you can see it goes well out into their, their later years. In this uh, Danish study, they looked at the incidents with which these women cohabitated with any other partner. These aren't necessarily sexual relationships, but that had normal interpersonal relationships where they lived with someone else. And you could see that in the middle uh, uh, screen, there, it was a, a significantly lower rate of socialization and cohabitation with other people. And if you look at the right, their, their uh, lifespan is shortened. If you look at the general population here on the right, the, the solid black line, the 45 XO Turner women have roughly a uh, 15 year a shorter expected lifespan. And then the other karyotypes can be intermediate. And I'll show you what those karyotypes are in just, in just a moment. Sorry. So in 1938, uh, Henry Turner in, in Oklahoma um, identified women who had infantilism, as he called it in 1938, means, meaning sexual immaturity, webbing of the neck, a skin, of the skin around their neck, deformity of the elbow called cubitus valgus. You can see here, if you ask these women to straighten their arm, they can't do it. There's always an angle here where, where the humerus and uh, uh, ulna and radius uh, meet at the elbow. Uh, the, it's often called increased carrying angle. Uh, Turner put this one on the map, essentially in 1938. If you see over in the lower left corner, uh, there, there had been previous uh, descriptions of this syndrome. Uh, as, as early as 1768. Uh, in 1930, uh, Ulrich in, in, um, in Germany reported a case, and oftentimes this is called Turner-Ulrich syndrome, a Bonavie-Ulrich syndrome. Another person that, that laid significant uh, uh, contributions into this uh, study was Fuller Albright, who was also a co-author with, with uh, Kleinfelter on the Kleinfelter syndrome. It, this was in Boston. Uh, Albright focused on the ovarian insufficiency of these, these women. Uh, Turner did not have the, the tools to, or a really understanding to, to establish what was going on, why they didn't go through puberty. Albright pointed out that they were, that they um, had uh, defective ovaries. And we'll show you that in a minute. Ford, it was not until 1959, so 21 years after um, Turner described this, that the 45X karyotype was was identified. All right, the genetics. Let's spend a minute on this. We're, we're going to come back and look at features of these. I want you to walk out the door and say, like, you know, I saw somebody in the grocery store that I think has this. Here's a karyotype spread of a, of a woman with Turner syndrome. Normal uh, autosomal chromosomes here is an X. Ordinarily, there would be a second X. In a male, there would be a Y over here. That's the classic. So it's about, it's less than 50% who have an absent uh, second X chromosome. Uh, 
in 75% of the cases, the lost or otherwise not normal second X chromosome, which I'll show you in a moment, is of paternal origin, not clear why. Maternal age, like in Down syndrome, is not a predisposing factor for, for Turner syndrome. Um, as I mentioned earlier, about 95% of 45X conceptions are miscarried before birth. Now, an important point, when you're dealing with a suspicious, a, a patient that you're suspicious of Turner syndrome in, you got to make this very clear to your cytogeneticist. You don't just say like, uh, please do a karyotype. You, you need to count at least 30 cells. In our institution here at Vanderbilt, the uh, pathology people count 50 cells because you have to be able to pick up mosaic forms of that. And I'll, I'll tell you about the mosaic forms in just a second. So this is the classic phenotype, one a genotype, one X chromosome and nothing else. The other, the other group of people who, are, who have Turner phenotypes and are considered Turner syndrome have things like this. So let's look at this panel A. There's an X chromosome, short arm, long arm, P, Q. This is a duplication of the long arm. This is an isochromosome of the long arm, one gigantic double long arm of a chromosome. So it means that there's a trisomy of long arm genes here, uh, and there's an absence of the second set of short arm genes, but that isochromosomes make up another maybe 15 or 20% of women with Turner syndrome. This is another version. This is, a, this is again, the normal uh, X. Over here is a ring of uh, X chromosome material that is uh, missing much of the significance. And so this is, this is a ring, this is the determination is like this 45 X plus mar marker means a marker. There's often a clump of uh, chromatin material that is uh, also Y, uh, sorry, X chromosome origin and a ring chromosome. Uh, that's essentially a non-functioning uh, uh, X chromosome. Now here we get into some other really interesting things. Here's again, normal X, short long arm. This is a short arm deletion, meaning uh, uh, all of the, the genes that are important for Turner's, and I'll show you what some of them are on the X chromosome, are missing. So they have a different phenotype than let's say the second one, the panel D, where you have the X chromosome um, short arm, the P, and you have a deletion of the Q, an XQ deletion uh, like this, where you, you have some of the genetic material from the X chromosome, but not the full spectrum of it. There's also a group of individuals like many other genes, and especially like as we talked about with Kleinfelters, where you have a line of cells that are 45X and, and 46XX. In other words, the, this did not happen uh, in the, in the um, uh, egg, and sp egg or sperm. And as I mentioned, usually it's the sperm that's the contributor, but somewhere postnatally. So you have a line of cells that are 46XX and a line of cells that are 45X. The more of the XX cells you have, the more normal the phenotype, the more the reproductive potential can be. If you're 90% XX and 10% XO, you have a fairly mild form of Turner syndrome. There are some forms as well that are mosaic between a 45X and a 47XXX. I've never seen that one. So I, I've, I've got to say, I I'm, can't tell you from experience. Uh, and the one other thing that is extraordinarily important to keep in mind is sometimes a little fragment of X material that is present there is really not X material, but it's Y chromosome material. This was meant to be an X, an XY, but significant parts of the Y chromosome are gone, but there are some marker chromosomes from the, from the Y chromosome that persist. They often aren't detectable in a general karyotype, like when you look at this, you have to be able to sometimes do uh, molecular markers to pick them up. But the, important, that's, the importance of this is that when there's any Y chromosome material, the risk of gonadoblastomas is uh, extraordinarily high uh, in later life. And for that reason, in women who have any Y chromosome material in their karyotype, gonadectomy is, is uh, strongly recommended. Now, let me point out to you, I just mentioned, you know, like you can have different phenotypes. Here's, here's an X chromosome again, short arm, P, uh, long arm, uh, Q. Uh, you can see in the upper part near this, this tip, near the pseudoautosomal region, um, that is where the skeletal phenotype, the Shox gene that is involved in the shortness, some of the visual spatial deficits that these women have is in the, um, 
short arm, the, the lymphedema gene, and I'm not sure that's been distinctly identified, seems to reside in the short arm. And, and then the premature ovarian failure genes tend to be in the long arm. There are at least two regions that are identified with that. So this gives you an idea, and I, I don't have time to kind of walk you through individual cases, why you can have a Turner syndrome phenotype and yet have relatively preserved uh, ovarian function um, if, if these, the, the, the Q arm, the long arm is preserved as opposed to loss of the, of the um, um, uh, short arm. All right, so I mentioned this, I think I'll go over this now, I'll pass over that. All right, what are the things we look for in Turner syndrome? They're short, they have skeletal manifestations other than just shortness. They have primary ovarian, ovarian failure or streak ovaries. I'll show you an example. They have congenital heart disease. That's a very significant part of this, aortic stenosis and bicuspid aortic valve. They have lymphatic obstruction that gives them part of their appearance. They have structural kidney abnormalities. They are prone to autoimmune diseases. They also have psychological and cognitive uh, deficits, and there's a cancer risk that's associated with Turner syndrome. So here's the skeleton. We've looked at this one before. Uh, I want you to look at this here, this fold of skin on the neck that uh, is called webbing, nuchal webbing. In a couple of slides, we're gonna talk about the lymphedema. This is the residual of lymphedema in the fetus. In other words, in utero, this was a large sack of fluid that has since been resorbed, but leaving redundant tissue. There's the increased carrying angle. Uh, a lot of people make a lot about this. It's an old concept of the shield chest there's really nothing I think you can measure that, that will say like, oh yeah, this is a shield chest, but it tends to be a kind of broad uh, chest uh, with um, certainly no, no feminization. Here are some skeletal features. Here's, here's the carrying angle here that I was telling you about that from this slide on the left. Boy, I'm assuming you can see my cursor. I'm sorry if, if I'm rushing through this and you can't see what I'm pointing at. Another hallmark of Turner syndrome is the shortened fourth metacarpal bone. Look at this knuckle here, the fourth metacarpal or the fourth metatarsal. Normally that knuckle should be sitting up above uh, the third and fifth. And this is a hallmark of Turner's. There's only one other disease. And I know I've talked to you about it in the past, but I'm, I'm assuming and you've heard every talk I've given to this group over many years. And I, I know that's not true. There's one other condition and that's called pseudohypoparathyroidism where you see a shortening of the fourth metacarpal. Again, these are defects in skeletal development uh, and there are genes for these things. There is uh, ear, nose and throat manifestations. Uh, in particular, uh, deformed small pinna. Sometimes the pinna is very kind of flappy, always low set. See the position, this is an extreme and I didn't, don't mean to, to um, ruin your, your uh, morning with this. Deformed pinna, dysfunctional eustachian tube. These kids are very prone to, chronic otitis, media and effusions, mastoiditis. They initially have conductive hearing loss, then it becomes sensory neural hearing loss to the point where up to 90% of these women have uh, sensory neural hearing loss after age 30. And here we have a cholesteatoma, right? Where the, where the tympanic membrane is drawn into the middle ear and squamous cells start to proliferate. Uh, it's not a cancer, but it can just as well be because it starts obliterating uh, structures within the middle ear and can extend into the Skull, shortness. Here is a growth curve. Uh, I think this is either the World Health Organization or CDC standards for non-Turner women. The mean height is uh, 163 centimeters. Here are Turner women, 144 centimeter. In the days when people didn't quite understand the physiology, this was well documented that the height velocity of these women, the dashed line, was unique in that at the time of puberty here, when other girls have a growth spurt due to production of estrogen and increased growth hormone secretion, the Turner women do not. And here, I, I, I wish I, I could do a whole hour on this concept. Growth hormone treatment, even though they're not growth hormone deficient by traditional standards, growth hormone treatment is uh, highly effective in increasing the height. This is a toddler study. In fact, I think it was called the top, Turner toddler growth hormone study. These are the untreated controls. These are the treated girls. And you can see here the increase in um, height velocity, uh, uh, the sta standard deviation score um, is significant in the treated group, 
But you can also see that the longer you treat or the longer you wait, the older they are, the less responsive they are. So it's very important that Turner syndrome be identified early when there's stature issues, and, and there almost always are, that they be addressed and the family offered uh, treatment with growth hormone. Eight centimeters, eight and a half centimeters is kind of the average of what we expect to get out of uh, treatment with uh, in these girls. That's enough to make your, your legs long enough to reach the, the controls on the car, the pedals and the accelerator, uh, and to, to do a lot for your, your ability to function in daily life. Here is a streak ovary, all right? So this is primary ov ovarian failure. This is a, a streak on this side, not an intact ovary. It turns out that the dysgenesis of the ovary actually is, begins in the, late, in the third trimester. In early trimester ovaries and Turner fetuses, um, they're, they're really quite normal. Th these are older girls, but this is a mosaic Turner who has a significant XX component. You see follicles. Here's another one with a, a large follicle, but this is the typical streak, it's fibrous tissue. The, the, one of the hormones that controls the uh, ovarian function is uh, follicle stimulating hormone uh, because the, the follicles, uh, the, because the cells drop out, you see FSH levels tend to be very high. Normal range is down here in gray. These are Turner women in the red. Puberty. All right, so about 30% of girls with Turner syndrome will enter puberty spontaneously, but 90% of them will ultimately go on to have complete ovarian failure. The other 10% are those who have, again, uh, 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 short or long arm deletions uh, or, or mosaics that are strongly XX. Um, there are some that have actually conceived and been fertile, but the vast majority are infertile and uh, do not go through puberty, which means that if we want to properly feminize these girls, but importantly, feminize their bones so that they develop a normal peak bone mass, we have to start estrogen replacement early. And the recommendation is between 11 and 12 years of age. Estradiol is the preferred uh, estrogen to use, and we're quite fond here of doing it as a patch, a transdermal patch rather than uh, oral estrogens. Fertility. Um, it almost never happens. Let me just drop to this third point here, which, because I had a patient who did this some years ago, uh, maybe about 20 years ago now, but it was not unusual to consider IVF so that the, the Turner woman would identify an egg donor. And uh, if they were married, uh, you know, a, a spouse for uh, sperm and then do zygote transfers. That's really fallen out of favor because of like significant cardiac complications with pregnancy and Turner syndrome. This is one where you have to work very closely with your cardiologist if you're gonna consider it. So the heart disease, two major things are aortic stenosis here on the left side and a bicuspid aortic valve. But the extent of cardiac uh, lesions can extend to pulmonary um, uh, and vascular anomalies, but uh, you know, pulmonic stenosis, anomalous uh, pulmonary venous return, abnormalities of the coronary arteries with, with consequences of um, uh, infarctions or hypoplastic left heart. These are rare. The common one is aortic stenosis. And here, so all infants in, in, with Turner syndrome at, who are identified at birth should have uh, a transthoracic echocardiogram. Once they reach adolescent age, they have a, uh, a, a um, cardiac MRI angiogram. You can see here uh, aortic stenosis identified in this. Um, this is where Dr. Salime is uh, going to be your best friend when you see these, these patients. Initial screening is, is uh, if it's normal, they should be followed every uh, five years as children and then every 10 years as adults. And these recommendations are still changing, and especially if you're considering, considering pregnancy. What happens is they might be quite normal at the beginning as, as children, and then you begin to see aortic root dilation and other, other features of, of um Turner's uh, uh, vascular dysfunction. The lymphatic obstruction, the, the, the webbing in the neck on the right side here results from lymphedema. That is a huge uh, pouch of uh, uh, lymph uh, in a fetus. And as that tissue is resolved, is resorbed, you, get, you see these uh, uh, pouches of lymphatic, um, lymphatic fluid you see this in the hands and feet. This is classic, puffy hands and puffy feet. And sometimes this persists into adulthood. 
One of the other consequences of that, that is a, it's a pearl that I learned years ago, and I think this is really, really helpful, is that their nails are dystrophic. And often you, you see that the, this is in the lower right corner, that the angle at which the nail inserts into the nail bed is, is acute, it's not flat. Uh, as, as one of my, my teachers years ago pointed out, you're, if you're, in fact, he told me he was looking, looking at a girl, he was trying to measure her, he got down to hold her feet down and he noticed her toenails were pointing up. They're not quite vertical, but they are certainly at a more acute angle than you're used to seeing. Horseshoe kidneys are another consequence. Each of these kids at diagnosis should have a renal ultrasound. They can have ectopic or duplicated ureters, which you, as you, you probably know are prone to uh, reflux. And you can also see ectopic dysplastic kidney. So there's one kidney in an utopic location, a dysplastic uh, ectopic kidney in another location. Renal function, very important to monitor. Autoimmunity is extraordinarily common in these girls. Uh, one of the commonest is autoimmune hypothyroidism or type one diabetes mellitus, both at high prevalence. Alternatively though, m most Turner women have trouble with uh, excessive weight gain in adolescence and adulthood. And so some of them can develop a type two diabetes picture or metabolic syndrome, which is not autoimmune. You can, you can distinguish these two uh, typically with, by measuring, looking for the antibodies that are associated with type one diabetes, which you're not gonna find here. They're also more prone to inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, sort of psoriasis, vitiligo, alopecia, many other uh, autoimmune uh, disorders. I'll point out here on the skin, you, it's probably hard to see in the lower right corner, but there are, there are multiple nevi. Uh, this is very typical of Turner women to have nevi all over the skin, especially on the back and trunk, but they have a high malignant transformation potential. In addition, these are not cancers, but there are hematoma in the GI tract of Turner women that often will bleed and you can get significant GI bleeding with these. To wrap up, uh, the cognitive. This is the part that we as pediatricians think, oh, well, it's not really our job, but I, I tell you the people that do think about cognitive stuff, both when they see a Kleinfelter's man or a woman with Turner syndrome are not tuned into the fact that these, that these women have significant uh, deficits. They're, they're very strong in verbal skills, IQ is normal, but they're quite poor in, in spatial, visual spatial skills. Map reading is not one of their strengths math, executive functioning, processing speed, there's a higher incidence of ADHD, and going on further, as I mentioned, uh, uh, difficulties in social relationships, uh, as I showed you on the Danish study. Um, in school, you, if, you, if you can identify this early, like diagnose them soon enough that while they're going through middle school and high school, by the time they're adults, at least they've had some Somebody, some, somebody try to help them address these issues. Poor organization and planning, that's the executive function. Some of them do much better with stimulants. Difficulties with peer relationships. Difficulty driving, I could see many things here. Part of it is like they can't, they can't reach the pedals unless you've treated them with growth hormone uh, of the car and also um, the spatial uh, navigation on the road. All right, so cancer risk, I think I've mentioned they have a higher risk not only the melanomas, but the gonadoblastoma, in, if you haven't recognized that they have Y chromosome material in their, uh, any, any Y chromosome remnants that are in the karyotype, cancer of the thyroid, colon, pancreas, gallbladder have all been described. So as a, as a prenatal study, or like this, what I'm showing you here is like a, the different times at which Turner women tend to be identified. Prenatally, obviously you saw that fetus ultrasound, uh, like a hygroma, massive hygroma, but you can also pick up these classic Turner uh, cardiac abnormalities on ultrasound and be warned. If you haven't done a karyotype, you should do a karyotype. Often, however, around here, often it's somebody has a routine karyotype, maybe maternal age, they're looking for Down syndrome and they pick up the Turners. Uh, in the neonatal period, the classics are edema of the hands and feet, coarctation of the aorta and some of the phenotypic features. Let me show you, uh, as you get into childhood, this is, this is one that's very, very, uh, to my, in my mind, pathic mnemonic of Turner syndrome. They have a low hairline. And if you look at this girl here, you see there's like three little, little uh, extensions of it. It's often called the trident hairline. 
trident was the, the three-pronged spear of Poseidon, the, the god of the sea. But the interesting thing about the Turner trident hairline is this isn't hair that's coming from below. The hair sweeps upward. It goes vertically from, from these, these little um, uh, foci of origin here. So there's the low set and upward sweeping trident hairline. And other, other things that you'll pick up on in, in childhood is the short stature, of course, the delayed puberty, the hearing issues, the primary amenorrhea, sometimes later in life is infertility. I really, really wish that, that it, it, even here where, where we have good resources for learning disorders that people who, who do learning evaluations could say like, you know, this reminds me a lot of a Turner syndrome. I, I've seen enough of these kids now that I really, I've diagnosed Turner's and Kleinfelter's kids, not so, I'm, I'm equivocal on the phenotype, but then when I, when I look at their personality, I'm thinking like, there's something not right about this kid. And it, it turns out that it's paid off. One other last point to make, if you suspect Turner syndrome, but the karyotype does not turn out to be something wrong with the X chromosome, consider Noonan syndrome. This often, this, before this was understood, this was called male Turner syndrome. These, are, these can be men, or males or females. There are a number of autosomal genes that are responsible for this. Uh, it's also not rare, one in uh, 1,000 or one to 2,500 births. Uh, short stature is part of it. Significant cardiac disease, but not aortic stenosis. This is pulmonic stenosis uh, in these kids or some with cardiomyopathy. There's a sweet little boy that I've been treating for a number of years who had a heart transplant because of his significant, with Noonan syndrome, uh, myopathy. And again, these, these are genes that you're not going to find on X's or Y's. These are in other locations. There are gene panels you can order. Uh, the, the boys have cryptorchidism. Again, this could be boys or, or girls. In this, you can see a face here. I, there's no way I could tell you that's a Noonan's or a Turner's, either of these girls. Um, if you look at the web neck, you look at the low set ears. Uh, they also have lymphatic dysplasias. There are guidelines for this, the, the International Turner Syndrome um, uh, Society. There's a, there's a, a, a scientific advisory group. Uh, this was last updated in 2017. You can see, you know, here's what you do. Every, you check the thyroid every year, you do this, you do that. I'm gonna conclude with one last point. In uh, 2019, the Turner Syndrome Society of North America, of, of the US, had its annual meeting here in Nashville. And the mother of one of my parents was the meeting organizer. Uh, and I'll show, you, I'll show you her daughter in just a minute. Uh, that's, that's a guitar there and, uh, and it's find your voice. The thing that I think really, really uh, empowers these girls who have a lot going against them is to meet other girls the same, of the same, with the same condition. One of the, my nurse, and I, I forgot to mention Barbara Duffy, who, who uh, uh, gave me a couple of these slides, uh, Barbara and I were involved in a number of lectures at this. Barbara commented, you could not miss the older Turner women who tended to be shorter, significantly short, who had clearly, un some of them seemed to have uh, just slow, slow operating speed, just maybe depression, maybe untreated, undiagnosed hypothyroidism. But when you, when you got all these, these, the little ones who were of normal stature and, and or, or close to normal stature and replaced with growth hormone, replaced with thyroid hormone if they need it, replaced with estrogens at the right time, it's made a world of difference. And I, I, I look to see, I don't see any evidence that there is uh, a Turner Syndrome Society in Jordan. Uh, if, if you are someone who takes care of a lot of these girls and you'd like to think about how you can organize some kind of a a support group or a, a chance for these women to meet the girls and women to meet each other uh, periodically, uh, I'd be happy to help. I can put you in touch with the Turner Syndrome Society, which has done a great job of this. And finally, I'm going to thank you. Uh, I, I wanna thank also here, Taya. Taya is a Turner patient of mine, or used to be my patient. She's now uh, in her mid twenties. Um, you, you would, if you saw Taya on the street, you would not think that's a Turner woman. Um, she struggled in college with learning, learning issues, uh, executive function issues, but uh, uh, her life is, is a different kind of life than a Turner woman would have had uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And I, 
again, want to thank you, and I hope to see you all again uh, next year uh, at the uh, 17th annual uh, visit. <laughs>